Good evening and welcome to Defund to Abolish. Before we get started, we'd like to make sure everyone has what they need to access this event. So thanks for your patience. Uh, bienvenidos a Desfinanciar para Abolish. Si desea escuchar este evento en español, haga clic en el botón en la parte inferior de la pantalla que dice Interpretación y seleccione Español. También recomendamos que haga clic en Silenciar Audio Original o Mute Original Audio para que solo escuche la interpretación en español y no el audio original en inglés. Si no ve el botón Interpretación, haga clic en el botón que dice More y la interpretación debería ser una de las opciones ahí. Si tiene problema para conectarse al canal en español, háganoslo saber enviando una pregunta haciendo clic en el botón Q y A, donde están las burbujas de conversación en la parte inferior de su pantalla. If you would like to use uh, closed captioning, for now, uh, we have live transcript available um, at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to click and select a uh, full transcript. Uh, and we hope to have our closed captioning up and running uh, shortly as well. Um, but the, the live uh, full transcript uh, will, will provide um, uh, a closed captioning service. Um, if you have any issues with the full transcript, uh, or the closed captioning once available, please let us know by clicking on the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any other issues accessing the event, please, please let us know through the Q&A feature as well, or by emailing us at defund to abolish colloquium 2021 at gmail.com. And we will do our best to assist you. This information is also available in the chat box. Good evening, my name is Tanali Seth. I am the Editor-in-Chief of the NYU Review of Law and Social Change, and I'm here with Aisha Krauss-Lee, Claire Lowender-Iverson, and Lauren Wilfong, the journal's colloquia editors. Welcome to day one of Defund to Abolish, a two-part colloquium bringing together more than 20 organizers, legal practitioners, and activist scholars to explore ways to defund and abolish the police, shift power to marginalized communities and actualize a police-free future. Each year, the NYU Review of Law and Social Change, an academic journal founded during the civil rights movement to support scholarship for social justice, hosts a colloquium on a complex and timely social justice topic with the goal of centering conversations that have otherwise been on the fringes of legal academia. We cannot think of a more urgent or relevant topic one that implicates so many intersections of oppression and resistance, but most especially our history and present of white supremacy and anti-Black racism than the movement to defund and abolish the police. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Aisha, Claire, and Lauren, Social Changes Colloquium organizers, as well as the many staff editors who have worked tirelessly over the last six months to put this colloquium together. This event would not be possible without our partners, NYU Black Allied Law Students Association and Latinx Law Students Association, as well as the generous support of the Student Bar Association and more than 40 co-sponsoring student groups, a complete list of which you can find in your program and on our website. This evening, we will hear from two amazing panels, each running approximately 70 minutes. You can find additional information on each panelist in your brochure, which you should have received this morning by email and on our website. Each panel will leave time for questions at the end, and you can send questions for the panelists by clicking on the Q plus A icon at the end at the bottom of your screen or by emailing defund to abolish colloquium 2021 at gmail.com. If you are an attorney seeking continuing legal education credits in New York State, you must have registered with us in advance and logged into Zoom with the same email address you provided to us prior to joining the event. Panel moderators will periodically announce and display for approximately 30 seconds CLE codes that you must write down and provide to us after the event in order to receive credit for attending. Each code will be read twice. With that, we will turn things over to our opening panel, Defund Means Defund, to set the stage for this important conversation by defining and contextualizing demands to defund and abolish the police and laying out a vision of the abolitionist futures panelists are building toward. The panel is moderated by Professor Jamelia Morgan. Professor Morgan teaches at University of Connecticut School of Law, where her scholarship focuses on issues at the intersections of race, gender, disability, and criminal law and punishment. Prior to joining the faculty at UConn, Professor Morgan was a civil rights litigator at the Abolitionist Law Center and worked to improve prison conditions 
and end the use of solitary confinement in Pennsylvania state prisons. Professor Morgan was previously an Arthur Lehman Fellow with the ACLU National Prison Project, where she focused on the impact of prisons on individuals with physical disabilities. You can read Professor Morgan's full bio on our website. Turning it over to Professor. Could someone help me with my video? It said that I can't turn my video on. Okay, here we go. Momentary hiccup. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to invite um, the co-panelists for today's panel to um, come off of or turn on their video. So it's really an honor to moderate this panel. I will be a good moderator and introduce our distinguished guests and turn it over to them for what I know is going to be a wonderful conversation and an important timely conversation around defund and abolition. So I'm going to read excerpted panelist bios. You can read more on the Law Journal's website. All right. Uh, Andrea Ritchie is a black lesbian immigrant whose writing, litigation, and advocacy has focused on policing of women and LGBT people of color for the past two decades. She's currently a researcher with Interrupting Criminalization and supports groups across the country working to defund and reduce the harms of policing and increase community safety. She is the author of Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, and co-author of Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Women, Against Black Women and Queer Injustice, the Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States. Cece McDonald is a transgender activist and revered icon of the LGBTQ community. She captured, inter captured international recognition in 2011 after surviving a white supremacist and transphobic attack, later receiving a second degree murder, uh, second degree manslaughter conviction and serving 19 months in prison simply for defending herself. She has been profiled in Mother Jones, Ebony.com, Rolling Stone, and is the subject of an acclaimed documentary Free CC, produced by transgender actress Laverne Cox. Since her release, she has graced stages across the country where she uses storytelling to articulate the personal and political implications of being both Black and trans. As one of the founders of the Black Excellence Collective and Black Excellence Tour created with best friend Joshua Allen, she fosters important conversations around mass incarceration, sexuality, and violence. Kempis Ghani Songster is a legal worker, organizer, and powerful public speaker. He served 30 years of a death by incarceration sentence in Pennsylvania after being sentenced as a child. Ghani is a founding member of Right to Redemption and the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration. He is a staff member with Amistad Law Project in Philadelphia and serves on the board of the Abolitionist Law Center. Mimi Kim is the founder of Creative Interventions and co-founder of Insight. She has been a longtime activist, advocate, and researcher challenging gender-based violence at its intersection with state violence and creating uh, community accountability, transformative justice, and other community-based alternatives to criminalization. As a second-generation Korean American, she locates her political work in global solidarity with feminist anti-imperialist struggles seeking not only the end of oppression, but of the creation of liberation here and now. Mimi is also an associate professor of social work at California State University, Long Beach. Her recent publications include The Carceral Creep, Gender-Based Violence, Race, and the Expansion of the Punitive State, and From Carceral Feminism to Transformative Justice, Women of Color, Feminism, and Alternatives to Incarceration. Uh, Mon Mohapatra is a organizer, writer, and illustrator from Bangalore, India, currently organizing around surveillance, ending jail expansion, and prisoner support programs in NYC. Her work focuses on uh, the reformist aspect of progressive criminal justice institutions and policies, as well as abolitionist feminist practices for ending the carceral state and Indian American anti-caste solidarity against fascism. 
She is the co-author of Eight to Abolition and founding organizer of the National No New Jails Network and Free Them All for Public Health. Wow, it's really an honor to be here and facilitate. I've learned so much from all of you over the years. So I'm gonna do the best thing I can and that is get out the way and get these questions to you. So the first question I wanna throw out there is this question of what do calls to defund the police and abolish the police mean to you? And how do they relate to each other? So if I may, perhaps we could go in the order that I introduced you. Andrea, I'll turn it over to you perhaps to start us off. I'm happy to start us off, but um, a lot of the folks on this panel are people I have learned from and followed and um, who have way more um, experience uh, than I do. But I do want to be clear and, you know, uh, interrupting criminalization, we put out a toolkit um, around defund the police, fund the people and defend black lives. And then recently put out an update called the demand is still defund the police. And in it, we have a chart that talks about how, about the relationship between the demand to defund, which is a strategy um, towards the horizon of ab abolishing policing entirely. And we make it clear that in this moment of, you know, COVID um, economic crisis related austerity, there are sort of possibilities of just cutting police budgets as part of an overall austerity program. And that we've seen that in many departments across the country. And um, that when we think about defunding as part of a strategy towards abolition, it requires investment, not only of the entirety of police budgets, um, but way more into the things that our communities need to survive the pandemics of COVID, of climate catastrophe, of police violence, um, and of course the pandemic of coronavirus and those to come, and to create communities that are genuinely and authentically safe um, and enable us all to not just survive but thrive. So defund is not just a budgetary exercise. It's not asking police to be more efficient in the ways that they kill us or beat us or harm us or deny us protection of safety. Um, it is actually uh, about shrinking not only the budget, but the power and the scope and the tools and the weapons and the ability of police to harm us and shrinking the contact we have with police. And most importantly, shrinking not only our financial investment in police, but our ideological and our emotional investment in policing as something that will bring us closer to safety because it doesn't do that. It contributes um, its own violence to a mix without preventing any violence and rarely interrupting it. So that's my understanding of the relationship. And, and I know that uh, my fellow panelists will um, definitely add more to that mix. Cece, I'd like to invite you in to answer the question if you were able um, Yes, um, for me, when I think of uh, defunding the police, uh, yeah, I have to completely agree with Andrea. The ideas of defunding the police go beyond the means of just taking away the funding and minimizing how much they get to police us. In my mind, defunding the police is, is also a means of redirecting those uh, resources, those funds into, um, I guess, other avenues of safety, of uh, community organizing, of, um, not, I wouldn't even say, you know, uh, policing, but more in the sense of like accountability and holding people accountable for uh, the things, but thinking of a way to have that accountability be productive, to be efficient, to be safe, to have uh, a, a space, um, I believe California just legalized small amounts of like uh, cocaine and meth and things like that. Even though that's that don't seem like a big step, I believe that 
it is a step in the direction of, I guess, eliminating the contact that people will have to have with police because now police don't have a reason to say, oh, well, these people are like they, you know, or whatever suspicions, you know, that cops have because anything could be suspicious to a cop for them to, you know, have a reason to, you know, I guess, interject themselves into people's lives. But um, I definitely believe that the funding goes further than just taking away the funds of police and I guess minimizing the way that they police, but absolutely removing those funds and those resources and redirecting them into other forms of um, community safety and you know community infrastructure and the building of of the people within our community in a better light uh, outside of having to have such a strict and violent way of dealing with you know the very things that white supremacy built up for us to fail at so um yeah i i think that defunding the police is it just goes further than just taking away the resources mm -hmm. thank you cc mimi i'd like to bring you in as well what are your thoughts mimi you're on mute still i also want to agree with andrea and um really uh uplift that report because i think it contains so much information um, and organize it so well. Um, I would say that it is a strategy along the way, but I think there's really interesting things about defund the police, like in a, hash, a moment where hashtags are very important um, and can really make something go viral um, that it, I think it's been a very also really productive kind of political way to, um, to voice a demand and a demand that people across the, this nation um, people, some people that you couldn't even have imagined having demanded that before said that they were behind. And that was, um, and the effectiveness of that and obviously of the protests and of the long-term organizing that had happened to, to, to put these things in place led to these kind of opportunities that we really hadn't seen um, that were so widespread. Um, I, I think another really important thing about defund the police is that it's also links really to um, local conditions and local strategies to actually see what that means on the ground. And so I think, uh, again, what the report really highlights is all the different ways in which people took an opportunity and put that into action. Some of which were very effective, some of which, you know, we saw the backlash happening and you obviously could have predicted it, um, that defund the police can often mean, oh, we're just gonna put it in something else that does not look ostensibly like the police, like let's put it in uh, Department of Education, public health, social work, those don't look like policing, but we also find that, um, and we have to re repeat this over and over again, that these institutions have been so tied to mm -hmm. kind of a carceral collaboration um, in this country that they already have you know, these very strong, sometimes unbreakable, it seems, relationships with policing and so, defund the police, you know, on the other side of it is, um, is that doesn't necessarily lead to less policing. Um, I think finally, I just want to say in, in terms of abolition work that we're also looking not only at defund, but what are we investing in? And that's um, really, really critical at this time as, um, you know, these dollars in some, in some cases are just being redirected to the police. In other cases have been um, there's an opportunity to redirect them other places. What are we building um, that, that we can stand behind that actually are not just another form of reform that um, just accommodates more policing, but an act is an actual move towards abolition. Thank you, Mimi. And hopefully we'll get time to talk about how we can protect abolition from that dilution, if you will. Um, I've been asked by our ASL interpreters to ask um, all of us to speak a little slower. We want to make sure that we are an inclusive space and in recognizing access needs here. So I'm going to try to do that as well. All right, Ghani, I want to turn to you next. Thank you, Jamilia. Peace and light to everyone whose fingerprints 
is on this very necessary event uh, to everyone out there who appreciates the necessity of turning tuning in to listen to this important conversation and salutes to my moderator Jamilia and the abolitionist law center and all my fellow panelists um, when i think about the role of defunding the police and abolitionist police ab abolishing the police and how those two things relate to each other um, abolition like any movement or human thrust for change in the quality of human life all human life is a process right and it's a process that proceeds not in a straight line but in a zigzag fashion as i've heard you know stony is the road we trot and that road like like i've heard articulated by some of our political prisoners that i spent time with is characterized by uneven development fits and starts periodic stagnation ideological splits big and small victories and major and minor defeats. And so abolition is an end game, it is division. Defund the police is one of the steps that we take towards that vision. And so it's, 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 it's not the end, but it's something that we do to get to, to the goal of abolition. And for me, abolition, when I speak about this, I speak about it from the perspective of a 15 year old boy who ran away from home in 1987. You know what I'm saying? 250 miles away to another state. And, you know, ended up with, you know, human blood on my hands that will never wash off, right? Spending 30 years in prison with other such people with blood stained hands, young people, right? And being able to get a, a close up look over the years, right? With what were the root causes and the dynamics, you know what I'm saying? That was sending all of these young people into prison with blood stained hands, blood from members of their own communities. And almost unanimously, like, you know, like with my story, was that things, they just didn't have anything in their community, you know what I'm saying? That they could turn to, or things that they had access to, like me, you know. Um, going to the Harlem Youth Federation as a young boy, seven and eight years old, nine years old after I immigrated to the US from Trinidad and Tobago. And remembering, you know, those being my fondest memories of having counselors and people that um, invested in me every day and took time to mentor me and teach me how to fish and how to make paper mache and take me on trips and show me how to start fires in the woods and take me hiking and things like that only for them to say one day, hey, you know, we lost city funding and um, we're about to close the center, right? At eight years old, nine years old, I didn't know what the hell that meant. But what I did know was one day when I came to the Harlem Youth Federation, the door was closed, right? And this was our refuge every day. And I, and I remember just standing outside the door with tens of us, kids looking around like confused. Where do we go now? And just remembering as the days went by when, you know, then we started hanging on the corners and then some of us started disappearing you know what i'm saying and we wouldn't know when where they went only to reappear months later or a year later with big muscles and then we started to understand that the muscles came from working out in detention center or jails or prisons right and so um, when i speak about defunding the police you know, on the road to abolition i'm talking about reinvesting in those things that create a community that's more conducive to children making better choices, right? And not taking away those things from our community that create an environment that exploits and exacerbates and damage the vulnerability of children and then condemn them for that when they act out their symptomatologies, right? And so defunding the police or abolishing the police is something that I speak about from um, a lived experience and direct experience, you know what I'm saying? Of somebody that's trying to figure out how to um, invest in those things that create an environment where we're not enemies to one another in the community, right? That empowers us, you know what I'm saying? To create more healthy environments where, 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 where we can make better choices as, as, as young people and as, as a community, right? Thank you, Ghani. Mon, wanna bring you in. What are your thoughts as to this question? 
Yeah, I am really honored to be here. Thanks to NYU, thanks to Jamelia for moderating and to my co-panelists. I um, really agree with what Ghani said around abolition being a vision and that def defunding the police is a step that we take towards abolishing the many systems that create um, what Ruth Wilson Goodmore calls organized abandonment. Um, I think for me, there's a few kind of things the, the relationship between defund and abolish has a few different meanings for me, particularly um, as someone who's really, who's, who spent much less time in this work compared to my co-panelists and who's really still learning a lot from them. Um, I think one of the big lessons for, through like the No New Jails fight in New York and through other kinds of fights here has been just the, um, Abolition means being able to see through the liberalism within our own institutions. So for example, within universities, nonprofits, any organizing spaces, all these kinds of spaces. So because the, the conditioning and the push in so many of these spaces is towards recycling different kinds of carceral structures, the kinds of prisons, kinds of courts and shelters that, um, you know, what Mimi's called the carceral creep, that just being able to like identify when that's happening is a huge part of being able to say, this is like, this is, we're trying to defund and then we're trying to abolish. And I think um, the interrupting criminalization toolkits are a great way to identify, you know, they, they provide really great ways to identify when that liberalism is coming up. Um, I also think that it means kind of seeing beyond the, the badge and the building of policing. So sometimes one of the big lessons has been um, realizing that sometimes we're not going to be able to destroy the building altogether or the, the badges altogether, but we are going to be able to build care structures um, and solidarity networks that provide the, way, the means for getting rid of those things ultimately. Um, and lastly, I think it means the implementation of, of you know, recently, I like, I wouldn't say alternatives either, but I, just like a caring economies and structures that actually allow people to survive. Um, and I think what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called abolition democracy in aid to abolition, we talked about um, community self-determination as one of the points that we think is necessary for abolition. And so I think between defunding and abolition, there needs to be ways for people to say like, this is what I want, and this is the vision I have for community safety um, in ways that are material and in ways that they, where they have power, um, because otherwise it's gonna be more of the same sort of top down um, approaches to, to abolition and to defunding and um, care. Thank you, Mon. I wanna give you all the opportunity to talk a little bit more about your work, uh, specifically how your work interacts with, contributes to this uh, movement right now to abolish the police. And so this is your chance to really just talk about the amazing work that you all are doing both now and uh, for, for a number of you over several years. So um, I'll open it up and whoever wants to get us started um, can speak first. I can start because I just spoke and, and I'll just go from what I uh, just said. And, and one of the things, um, the other things that I was thinking about in relation to the first question that relates to this one is just that a lot of the um, different kinds of organizing that I've done, and it's primarily been in uh, on Lenape Hooking, New York City, um, has been not just in relation to police and prisons, but it's been through tenants associations or environmental groups and things like that. Um, and repeatedly uh, the threat of arrest and the threat of incarceration have been a way that those organizing um, efforts have been stifled. So a big um, part of like the organizing has been to be in different kinds of groups that not, don't always have a focus on mass criminalization in the PIC, but to bring that analysis into there because almost everybody's kind of efforts to have housing for everyone um, or to like, you know, uh, challenge why climate change is happening are kind of um, pushed back by 
the threats of policing and mass criminalization. Um, and I think of things like um, union organizers getting arrested at protests or when they're striking or um, Mumia Abu, Abu Jamal getting arrested when he tried to vote uh, a couple months ago. And the ways that I think my work interacts with policing is, is a variety of levels. I think a lot of it is trying to just maintain solidarity and relationships with people who are incarcerated in New York. So in, in Rikers and in the tombs, um, in order to like build material relationships with them and their families to kind of one, learn like what are their needs and what kind of organizing they, do they wanna do and how we can support, but also um, to be able to influence the like outside pushes we're doing to either get rid of prosecution or to um, challenge the construction of jail expansion by directly connecting with the people who are going to be impacted by it. Um, and then I think the movement to defund and abolish is, especially in the coming year in New York City, there's going to be city council and mayoral elections. The last mayor was the one who was the architect of the current jail expansion plan. The next mayor would have the potential to change that on some level, but also the you know state legislators would have the potential to challenge um, pretrial detention and those kinds of policies. And so a lot of the organizing looks like not necessarily constantly pushing for accountability from elected le leaders, but um, organizing amongst the community to provide education for how people can say, no, this is not what I want. And I think um, DRUM is an example of an organization in Queens, New York, that does this really well, um, where they actually inform their communities in a variety of languages about the kinds of policing and criminalization that occur in their communities and how to respond to it and how to stop it from growing. Cece, do you want to talk about your ongoing organizing work and advocacy? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I've, I'm still um, in the process of working on the More Than Sisters project, um, which was, uh, I guess, uh, a project that kind of brought the trans queer feminine perspective to like abolition work and uh, building revolutionary, you know, uh, movements and thinking of ways to kind of expand on that. Um, I mean, unfortunately having to uh, navigate through this pandemic has been like super hard for me, especially with me having a pre-existing condition that involves my lungs and um, just the fear of having to deal with that kind of thwart, thwarted, you know, my work. Um, but I am still in the process of uh, working on the More Than Sisters project. Um, I've also been thinking of other ways to connect with folks during the pandemic. Um, since I have been spending majority of my time indoors and on the web uh, via uh, web uh, video communi communications, uh, thinking about uh, how to kind of use what we're going through now as a module for how to, you know, understand you know, how prison systems work because a lot of people who have to stay indoors or, you know, the or even the ideas of house arrest and having those arguments with folks like, well, at least you get to be at home and this and that. And it's like, well, it's still not fun having to be locked in your house because it's your house. You know, it's, it's the confinement, it's the not being able to, you know, experience, you know, the world and uh, that, tends to affect people, um, uh, and even myself, like a lot of what I'm going through now is, can be triggering to like some of the feelings and the ideas, uh, the emotions that were conjured when I was in jail, more specifically when I was in solitary confinement, um, because, you know, I don't have pets or you know family to live with, and I'm really by myself majority of the time. And um, 
it can be, you know, taxing on the mental health. Um, and I think that this time can be a very pivotal time for people to think about things like that. Like how, how do we see people reacting, you know, because there have been some serious cases of people uh, having serious mental breakdowns, even uh, killing themselves due to the solitude of uh, having to stay indoors from COVID. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna be a while before things, you know, probably get back to normal. And I really think that, you know, and also even considering like, if you are in your place in the free world and you're feeling how you're feeling, can you imagine how a person in a jail or prison is feeling right now? Like, I'm sure that the policing, the solitude, the fear, the, the, uh, the depression is, you know, in overdrive in those, you know, environments. So, um, Andrew, one of the things we, I was, oops, sorry. Did we lose her? I, I think so. I will check in. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, specifically, Andrea, if you could talk about some of the work that you've been doing specifically to, um, I guess as public education study and struggle, you know, comes to mind, but, but the work that you've done to just teach uh, the world about abolition, I think I, you know, personally um, recall like the op-ed that you wrote with Maryam Kaba after, in Essence Magazine and the work that you did to sort of distinguish calls for prosecution of the officers that killed Breonna Taylor as, as not abolitionists, but identified the, the tensions in that and like recognized <laughs> the humanity in those that also call for that. And so I, I'm wondering like for those and Mimi as well, like the role that you both play in your own work in educating people on what abolition is um, what role do you think study and struggle plays in this fight to abolish the police and systems of uh, carcerality and criminalization and, and how can we better educate ourselves and be better advocates on, on that particular front? Just wondering if you, Andrea or Mimi, both want to speak to that. I mean, I think I want to highlight and I mean I learned a lot of what I know from uh, Mimi and Insight which was you know a political home for both of us for a long time but I want to highlight that I came to um, abolition as a survivor of both police violence and interpersonal violence of not getting protection when I experienced interpersonal violence um, and then experiencing um, sexual violence by police and seeing that reality in my community of Jamaican immigrants in Toronto of um, survivors of you know domestic violence of youth who left home as Ghani was saying of uh, people in the sex trade of people who are profiled as using drugs and came to abolition and I think my role in the work has been sort of trying to document this um, is is a very visceral like like black feminist rooted in experience understanding of the fact that you know policing and prosecution don't make black women queer and trans people safe um they criminalize and punish us and then subject us to more violence and cc's story is but one example among many of how that happens and so my role has mostly been documenting that reality again through a black feminist praxis of our lived experiences point to the answers. And so documenting how policing, not only by police, but as Mon and, other, and Mimi were talking about, by all the institutions that are set up to police black women and queer and trans people's bodies and experiences and um, reproductive lives and economic lives. Um, understanding how all those things operate gets us to abolition much more quickly. You know, when we look at issues around policing and punishment through the lens of the experiences of black women, queer and trans people, you get to abolition much more quickly. And that's how I came to it through that very 
organic praxis. Definitely the last one I let go of was prosecuting cops. Um, but I came to understand as someone who also was a police misconduct attorney for years and Rachel Hertzing, you know, from critical resistance sat me down one day and explained to me that I can't be about tearing down a system one minute and legitimizing it the next. I can't say the system can never deliver justice except when it's supposed to be criminalizing its own and the people who are doing the job that they were created to do. And so I, I just, as we outlined in that article, as survivors, I think defund and abolish is about wanting more for ourselves as survivors and for Brianna and Brianna's family um, than the system that's set up to kill us is ever gonna deliver and not wanting to legitimize it for one second because I want so much more. And most of all, I want Brianna to still be here. And so in many ways I've been, that's been my life has been documenting the ways in which the system perpetrates. And as Reina, sorry, as uh, Tourmaline says, you know, is a primary perpetrator of violence against black women, queer and trans people um, pointing, um, like shining a light on that to push us to explore the things that we've been talking about as genuine sources of safety. And so Mimi and I did that back to back two years in a row at the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence in 2005 and six, we both had sort of sequential keynotes where we sort of went, this is what's happening with the system we have now. This is not protecting the majority of people. 43% of domestic violence survivors never call the cops. Two thirds of sexual violence survivors never call the cops because we know what will happen to us, including more physical violence, more sexual violence. We want to not leave those survivors behind. We don't wanna leave our communities behind. We want more for survivors and we don't want um, uh, you know, the police who killed Breonna Taylor to be able to do anything like that ever again. And so that's been sort of how I've done the work in terms of the last year, I just had the privilege of being able um, to kind of bring a bunch of skills to bear to support campaigns on the ground in Minneapolis where CC is from, in Philadelphia and in cities across the country in doing kind of policy analysis around, you know, what, what's the budget policy, training all of us up in budget advocacy, because those of us fighting to take down cops, um, we see numbers and I mean, I don't know, I'll speak for myself. I see budget numbers and budget advocacy and my eyes start to roll back in my head because that's just not my expertise. Um, but when we're trying to figure out how to pull power and resources away from the institutions that are killing us, we're having to develop a bunch of skills together um, and strategies together and learn together in order to come back um, and push further down the path to abolition. So that's sort of been my role at interrupting criminalization. Um, yeah, I can just want to, okay, oh, go ahead, Mimi. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just build a little bit on um, what Andrew was saying. I mean, there's so many ways to address this, but um, I think in, in looking at, in particular, about interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, violence that happens in the home among people we know, um, these are the complex forms of violence that people are experiencing, you know, at this very moment now. And so I, I think in um, trying to, one, being in a movement in the United States that has taken the gender-based violence and said, no, this is what we have to do is turn towards policing. Um, I worked within, um, I was a part of a movement that had increasingly, and really this was done by the 80s, said, no, police was the answer. And so many of us said, no, it's not. We would never call the police. Well, we know, listen, we know how many, that so many people would never do that. They don't want even to call our crisis lines. And yet we say over and over again that this is what we want people to do, say over and over again, you know, if you can't reach us, call 911 when we know very well that people are not calling 911. So um, I think that there was like this, this inc increasing um, understanding as more and more of us, uh, particularly people of color came together and said, this is, these are not the responses that we're looking for in our communities. This is not what people are asking for. Now, I'm not gonna say that uniformly across the board, nobody would, but that is the only answer. And even now you'll see so many people that cannot think of anything else other than leave, call the cops, um, do something that's punitive. And so I think it's been the last 20 years that a lot of us have been just continuously and without stop 
reformulating our response to violence in terms of collective power, in terms of responses that do not replicate or you know, don't call, don't call the cops, and then don't replicate calling the cops in our own communities, and don't necessarily just uh, rely upon street street justice uh, as a response. And it's really, it's really challenging. It brings up all of the things that we're talking about in terms of having the, the kinds of communities and just our own lives, our own friendships, our own ways of doing our political work that do not reproduce because we are so prone to do that is so in our heads that um, I think this has really been a strong and an evolutionary process in coming up with a lot, what a lot of people now call transformative justice as a politic, as practices, but as a way of life. So I think that reformulation reframing has been really important, but I also want to push that action is very important. And just talking about it is not enough. We have to do it. And it's hard work. It's challenging. We make mistakes and we have to rely on each other and say, what do you, this is really hard. I actually don't want to forgive this person. I actually want them to get hurt or I don't want anything to happen to them because I care about them. They didn't mean it. Something like this, all of those, that kind of range of responses that we have to violence and really, really looking towards very, very deep social justice and liber liberatory um, types of principles to see our way forward. I think this has really been a critical part of abolition, not just abolishing something, but building again and seeing what we want in our lives now and in the future. Thank you, uh, Andrea and, and Mimi for lifting up those complexities, especially as it relates to violence. You know, um, I think you know, what I've noticed since the, the defund movement got re-energized over the summer, right? Got this, this boost of energy over the summer was this, this oversimplification of it in the media. You know, I know we started out, I think it was in June, right after, like a couple weeks after the uprisings, I saw a statistic that said Donald Trump, you know, favorability real ratings at the time, Donald Trump 40, 42%, Joe Biden, 45%, defunding the police, 54%, all right, across the country. So something like we've never heard of this before, 15 states, I mean, 15 cities in various states, you know, making moves to defund the police. You know, the, this, this, this idea that was at, at, at one time was a non-starter, you know, had became like this, this popular thing. Um, then a couple months later, by August, Newsweek came out with a statistic that said 81% of the Black community were not in favor of defunding the police. Um, I know the, the narrative wasn't this simple, right? Um, but I, you know, I, I do understand that some people out there weren't in favor of defunding the police. Um, the Amistad Law Project, we wanted to take this complexity head on, kind of like what you were talking about, Andrea and Mimi. Um, and lift up the voices of regular people, even people who were harmed, you know, just to hear how they felt about defunding the police. We had to, we had to address this, you know, we couldn't act like these contradictions didn't exist in our community, right? Um, it wasn't like our movement was trying to shove something down everybody's throats. We're really trying to, you know, figure out what's the best course for our community to full human development. You know what I'm saying? We know that the way we've been going about things ain't working you know what i'm saying and so um so we started you know what we call everyday philadelphians for defunding the police where we lift up the voices of directly impacted folks folks who, who survive violence and harm who've lost family members to murder to hear how they feel about uh defunding the police you can see these videos we've done a few of them we even started started a podcast uh, called move it forward where we denote devoted two episodes um um, part one and part two, defund, uh, to defund or not to defund and defund now. Well, we spoke to city councilwoman um, Kendra Brooks and Hiram Rivera, director of the Community Resource Hub for Safety and Accountability, because we want and because we wanted to really lift up the complexity of this this um, this issue of defunding the police and abolition. You know, so thank you, Mimi, for for um, making it clear that abolition is not just about closing anything. It's not just about closing prisons or ending the police, right? Abolition is about a greater vision of the kind of society that we want to create. You know what I'm saying? That we want to leave behind for future generations. Let's be clear. 
the most damaging or pernicious effects of human warehousing, which is what I choose to call mass incarceration, can be seen in the struggles of children of incarcerated parents, for example, three times more prone to depression, more likely to, um, for, to, to have anxiety disorders and school phobias and relationship strains and, and dysfunctionality and the whole nine, seven times or 85% more likely to be incarcerated themselves if no positive intervention is made in their lives. And there are about 10 million children across the country who, um, who have or had um, a family member on the inside. And so even if we were to close all prisons or abolish all police, the effects of human warehousing slash mass incarceration would continue to be felt for generations. So our work wouldn't end with the closing of prisons or the abolishing of the police. It would actually probably be kicking into another gear because that's where the healing work would have to begin. That's what, you know what I'm saying? Actually implementing, you know, um, imagining a better world, a better society would have to begin. So I, so I just want to echo that um, and, 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 and lift that up that this, when we talk about defunding the police, you know, we're not just um, having some oversimplified um, conversation, you know, about this issue that we're really, really, um, you know, we're taking on the complexities of violence. We can't have this conversation without looking at, you know, the, the roots of intracommunal violence in our communities, right? Because when we talk about defunding the police, that might not sit well with the mother or, the, the daughter or anybody that might have to walk from the train station to her house, you know what I'm saying, through um, through a socially toxic environment that might not sit well with them sending their children to the corner store and hoping that they get back, you know what I'm saying. And so we um we have to attend that conversation of defunding the police with attention to um, the intracommunal violence, the domestic violence, you know what I'm saying. Uh, and that's not how the state has been dealing with it. The state does not have a complex theory of violence. The state looks, the state, the, the prisons and the police see themselves as a hammer and every problem is a nail. And what our communities need is not hammering, but healing. What our communities need is not hammering, but resources. We need parks, we need rec centers, we need counselors, we need mentors, right? We need an investment in the best in ourselves and to believe in ourselves, believe in our capacity to control our own affairs, to keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves healthy and not be occupied by an occupying um, army, basically, right? Um, we need to be, we need our confidence as a, as, as, as a community to be, to be nourished, right? And to be constantly patrolled right, to be constantly occupied and, and is basically to say that we don't have the capacity to deal with our own problems, right? We're not, being, we're not investing in our own capacity to, to, to address our harms, right? And so abolition is about all of that. Abolition is a grand vision of creating a healthier society, not just about closing anything, but like, like Mimi said, it's about building a better world. Thank you, Ghani. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in to just add to that, to, to say that uh, everything uh, I completely agree with. And there's a way in which we excise police violence from the violence that our communities experience. And I think that's what I was trying to get at in terms of my work, that in the examples that Ghani just gave, you know, a, a mother or a sister walking to the store definitely is at risk of sexual violence from community and also at risk of sexual violence by police in that same situation right, that moms are worried about their kids going to the store and not coming back. One of the ways that can happen is the way it happened for my Brown's mom. And so I, I feel like this is the dynamic that ends up getting set up is that, you know, there's violence and then there's, as Ghani was saying, police is the only answer, even though it, it's not an answer. Um, people want resources in our communities. And so when people, when, when the um, statistic that Ghani lifted up you know, comes out, it's a very simplistic argument, right? If you say to people, there's only one resource that's gonna come from the state to your community, and that's a cop. And then you say to those same people, we're gonna take that away. People are like, wait, that was gonna mean nothing, right? And that's not the question that's being asked. What we're saying is we want people to have a thousand options in every situation, including options for healing. 
Um, but that's not the question Newsweek asks, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, I love that that's the question that you're asking in Philadelphia, Ghani, if people is like, but what? And I think that's the question we all have to ask as Mimi was saying, right? What do we actually need to feel safe? And then once we get there, how are we gonna build it, the hard part of it, um, recognizing police as part of the violence that we're experiencing. Thank you. I wanna pause briefly to read the CLE code. The code is key 12, K-E-Y-1-2. All right. Mon, I wanted to bring you also into the conversation to now respond to some questions coming from the audience. The question is, um, how does prison reform fit into an abolitionist framework? How do we pursue material improvements for people in prison without losing sight of the ultimate goal of abolishing those prisons or legitimizing prisons? Yeah, I really, I really like that question. And I answered it partially in chat. So I, I might repeat some of what I wrote in the chat. Um, but for me personally, and this is a tension that's come up in a lot of different kinds of organizing, especially as some of the things I was doing four years ago really revolved around um, campaigning towards legislators and, you know, to say, don't build these jails, which are being, so in New York, the new um, borough-based jails are being built because part of the justification is that jails like Rikers are just so uh, derelict and um, in such disrepair that, they, that the city needs new jails so that people have better kind of jail spaces to live in. Um, and so that tension came up a lot, which is like, how do we support people in saying like, there, yes, everybody deserves not, you know, better spaces, but also that shouldn't be a justification for new jails and for jail building. Um, and I, as I wrote to this person, I would say that working with people who are detained, arrested and incarcerated to demand better prison conditions is not oppositional to abolition. Um, the state and other forces invested in perpetuating incarceration as a solution to widespread social problems like unemployment and houselessness do not want to provide resources to people who are incarcerated. They don't want to provide resources to people who are facing arrest or criminalization. That's why prisons have been using solitary uh, confinement to, instead of PPE to deal with COVID-19. That's why they've been refusing to let people out of jails who are being held pretrial instead of just giving people um, you know, saying that, as Ghani said, and as other people have said, um, prisons are not built and jails are not built for people to socially distance. And despite that, that's, they've been used as a response to COVID-19, even going as far as to arrest people who were part of the uprising, people who were not wearing masks. There was a report today that um, people who migrate or travel to the UK will be arrested if they, um, if they travel despite the ban. Um, so I think supporting the demands of people inside, as in the case of the recent St. Louis uprising, um, for better conditions is part of demanding abolition because intrinsically we know that those demands are not supported by the, the structures that benefit from using incarceration to deal with social issues. And additionally, at the local level, demands for bettering conditions can be attached to demands for decarceration. And, and for example, ending pretrial detentions, so there can be more empty prisons. But um, insofar as the, you know, people are able to see through the kind of like justification for building new jails or new systems that perpetuate criminalization and incarceration. Thank you, Mangani. Amelia, police and the state, the police state and the carceral state are both symbiotic and synonymous. You know, prisons get filled by police. The police corral and cuff you, the courts condemn you, and the prison system cages you. Together they kill you. And this system is not broken or failed. It works very well at what it was designed to do to who it was designed to do it to. Together these players corral, cuff, condemn, cage, and kill who it was made to. They both operate, as I said, hammers for every problem which they view as a nail, defunding and eventually abolishing 
these institutions is about getting already wounded communities from under the hammer of the state once and for all and getting us what we need, which is healing and the ability to shape healthier lives and futures for ourselves. Big picture and not necessarily the biggest picture. One of my fellow, fellow panelists or one of you out there might give us a bigger picture, but a, a, a big picture of police and prison abolition is the liberating of the commons. The way this scenario is set up, this scenario we're all confined to and trying to figure and, and, and fight our way out of, is those things, all the things that were once free and accessible to all people by the sheer bounties of the earth, land, food, freedom to move without borders, freedom to love and, and, and relate, be in right relationship with each other and with our planet, the bare essentials that we need to live simply so that others could simply live, right? Have been enclosed. You know, it's been hoarded and held hostage by a few and a force of armed and trained brainwashed people right, have been hired to protect these enclosures, right, these stolen things. And the only way we can access those once common things is by selling our labor or actually being forced to labor because it's the only way we'll eat, uh, clothe ourselves, shelter ourselves, and lead a semblance of fully developed human life. If we don't obey, if we don't try, if we try to cut corners to get access to those things, that's what the police are for. That's what the courts are for. That's what prisons are for. All right, um, abolishing prisons and police is about abolishing this inhumane and oppressive arrangement. It's about freeing the commons, freeing the land as brothers and sisters in the black liberation struggle would say, so that we could access the things extended to us by our planet for us to realize full human development as responsible members of the human family, as responsible and seamless parts of our planet's ecosystem. So abolishing the police and prisons has to happen simultaneously with abolishing those forces that enclose the commons to begin with, abolishing capitalism, abolishing that which modern policing is designed to protect, industrial capitalism, the 1%, fossil fuel burning companies and fossil fuel burning cultures. That's big picture. So abolishing the police and abolishing prisons is not just some, you know what I'm saying, some isolated, struggle by people that don't have nothing else better to do. You know, we see this as um, a, a, an important and indispensable part, right, to leading meaningful life, to ensuring full human development for every child so that every child could have, have a life where they could maximize their potential and they can walk about without fear of being killed by their community members or by these patrollers, these armed patrollers who we don't need. You know what I'm saying? We don't need. They weren't the, 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 the inception of police, of modern policing, the creation of modern policing was not to protect and to serve us. It was to protect and serve industrial capitalism, protect and serve the rich. And I think knowing that history, right? Knowing that the police department does not have a noble inception that they did not come, the, the clouds in the sky did not open up and they did not descend to earth on a ray of light with angel music in the background, right? That their inception was sort of insidious, if not all the way insidious. Knowing that history and letting that history inform our movement, you know what I'm saying? Where we can continue to push police to, to, to like raise some serious questions about the cultural, the ill-earned and ill-deserved cultural legitimacy that police have. I think it's an important part of our movement is to raise those questions about police legitimacy and, 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 and keep the big picture in mind that defunding the police, defunding prisons is an indispensable part of us being fully human. Thank you, Gami, and thank you, Mon, for sharing the resources on racial capitalism. Um, one of the questions that we received touches on what you covered, Gani. Is it possible to reach the goal of abolishing the police and prisons in this neoliberal capitalist system? You lifted the abolitionist arguments for why that world, that abolitionist future is not a world in which we have a capitalist state or a neoliberal state that operates off predation, that deprives, that exploits. 
I want to go to the incredible questions that we have. I'm going to try my best. Thank you to Emily and Rachel for helping synthesize. There are a number of questions that ask about the post-carceral, post-police society. One specific one, um, especially when thinking about the needs of people who would be released from prison as a result of abolition. How do we plan uh, for this post-carceral, post-police society? So I see that as sort of like an implementation question as well as one that might invite you all to imagine as you've stated before what this abolition future would look like. So that's that's one question. Um, another question um, is related to, I guess, the nonprofit industrial complex. How do we get nonprofits, the questioner asked, to speak in abolitionist terms? There is so much disagreement on using the word abolition and organizing NGOs. Often the claim is that the word abolition alienates potential partners, presumably in this this world. Similarly, what should we say to faith organizations like churches that are hesitant to embrace abolitionist and defund calls? So big, big questions, but wanting to see if anybody wants to tackle either of those. Um, I guess I'll go since I got disconnected and missed the last round. Um, so I guess I can answer all three of those in, in, in a kind of way. The first one is uh, the fears that mainstream society or even some fake, you know, abolitionists or reformists, the ideas that, you know, what the world would be like or even our communities would be like without jails or prisons or police and, or, you know, a, a world where, you know, those things don't exist anymore, including, you know, the infrastructures that push those ideas. Um, I, I think that people focus so hard on like uh, the fears and what the, the ideas of like, I guess a society that's, you know, that's, I guess has no structure that's anarchal, that's, you know, just free and whatever the case may be. Uh, kind of like how uh, Gotham City or, you know, any fiction, fictional comic book place where there isn't really <laughs> a, a, a police structure or infrastructure uh, that there's going to be just complete mayhem. And then I always have to remind people that uh, a lot of the criminals that we are so afraid of are the people that are the people who's supposed to protect and serve us that are supposed to implicate these laws that are supposed to you know make sure our bodies are well so you can't focus so much because I feel like that is a tactic that was used uh in in race baiting and and kind of pushing this idea that you know, because when you think about the prison population and what the majority race of, of the prison population is, which is black and brown folk, that those ideas correlate, right? Like it's not a coincidence that people are afraid of jails and prisons not being gone because it's full of white rich people, right? They're afraid because there's going to be an influx of black and brown bodies pushed out into our neighborhoods and the, and that scares people because they know that these people will have to live somewhere and and I guess the ideas of you know the crime elevating in their neighborhoods but um I don't think there's no one more criminal than uh, Donald Trump or a police sheriff or a uh, 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 Giuliani or any of the rest of the folks who are put in positions of power and get to abuse those positions in that power and, and get to walk freely, right? So the ideas that we have about criminals, right? Uh, you know, in the small percentage of people who are in prison for what one would consider a, a heinous crime, uh, I believe that, you know, when people see me and I tell them like, oh yeah, I went to prison for manslaughter and they're like, what, how, you know? And then I have to go through this whole long story and tell them everything. And I don't think that it sits on people the ways in which uh, 
we let a, a larger society decide how uh, one incident can, you know, make a person see you differently. Right. Um, so when I have to explain to people about being charged with murder and things like that, you know, especially for folks who's who's like, but you're, you know, you're so quiet and you're so this and you're so that. When you look at the rates of women in prison, a majority of those <laughs> women who are in prison are for self-defense, defending themselves against abusive partners, right? And, uh, or even, you know, uh, in, inside of male prisons where a uh, majority of the people who are in prison are in there for petty drug crimes, right? The small percentages of people who are actually in prison for, you know, murder or sexual assault or things like that. But then we also have to, again, lay weight to society and say, well, a lot of these things could be prevented. Uh, again, when we think about abolishing police uh, and having those conversations, it's not, it's very rare that you hear people say like, oh, what about safe usage spaces, right? Instead of criminalizing people for doing drugs, how about we make spaces safe for them? How about we, you know what I'm saying? Because Big Pharma have been getting rich off of the deaths of people for a very long time. And it wasn't until white people started croaking that, you know, people actually started caring, right? And so it's, you know, it, it bothers me when, you know, people kind of, you know, drug dealers in my neighborhood, but you go right to your medicine cabinet and pull out a, a million count bottle of fucking Oxycontin and, you know, your, your nephew or your cousin, they distribute it and that. So like you, you're you not blaming Big Pharma for being uh, a drug pusher, right? So I think that a lot of those ideas just come from the fear mongering tactics that, that has just been a part of racial history and how directing in correlating criminal or criminal activity to black and brown bodies kind of push this idea or separate certain things. It's just like crack in versus cocaine, right? We know those are both the same thing, just processed differently, but somehow crack uh, gave people more time in jails and prisons than cocaine did. Why? Because cocaine was seen as a rich man's drug and only white people used cocaine, which is false let's mind you and you know that was just something that was put out there so the ideas of like uh, a post uh, abolished prison police system society is is nothing more than like where you are now and in, in your life just without those things um and i think people need to stop focusing so hard on that um as far as using or I feel like, uh, you know, uh, abolish, abolishment or, you know, police abolition or whatever type of abolition work that people do um, has, it's starting to become one of those buzzwords, like uh, ally. Um, and, I, and I tell people all the time, like, I'm so tired of the word ally. Like, everybody wants to be an ally. Everybody thinks they're an ally. And, you know, that word has become so loosely used that, you know, you hear a proud boy saying, oh, I'm an ally to black folks. Right, exactly, I bet. Um, and <laughs> it's just frustrating that, again, this is the world that we live in, that we have to debate whether or not an organization or a church should back away from the term because of the fear of partners. Like, if a person isn't willing to work with you or willing to... Uh, give you the funding or the coins you need to to elevate the work around uh, getting people out of systems of oppression and abuse and violence and, and, and slavery, then, I, then maybe you shouldn't be working with those people because they are on the opposite side of, you know, humans thriving and, and being able to exist in the world. And that's, that's just simple. I mean, there shouldn't be any debate about that. If you are one of those people in that situation, whether you are the entity itself, then maybe you should think about the way that you are doing the work because there's no way that you can say that you are a resource center, that you are here, you know, you're an organization for helping people. I had this issue with the uh, human rights campaign when they didn't want to have anything to do with my case, but then all of a sudden, when CC McDonald became a big name, then here comes the human rights campaign. Like, hey girl, hey, like, no, like, fuck y'all. Y'all really 
decided to not have anything to do with my case because it was complicated. And, you know, when I think about the deaths of trans women all the time, like how complicated is it for a person to see the rights of a human? right? To put aside everything of that person and realize that that is a human being, that was someone's child, that was someone's caretaker, that was someone's, you know, lover, friend, whatever. And, the, you know, because something is too complicated for someone to, to be involved, lets you know that, you know, their ideas of humanity and like right and wrong are based on a, on a value, a, a capitalistic value and how far that they can go in whatever they're doing and how fat they can load their pockets. And so, you know, my answer, that's why I, I don't work at, I, I, I'm, I try to like move away. I actually even started my own 501c3, um, the Black Youth Support Network, because I just feel like there's nothing out there that's giving, you know, Black youth the tools that they need, right? I was just saying, like, the 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 laws around gun violence are so stupid and so skewed that, you know, taking guns off the street, let's just, you know, realize that that's not going to happen. But Black men being arrested on having guns without certain permits uh, elevate their chances of having longer prison terms, longer jail terms. So why aren't people like investing in, you know, getting black men guns? I mean, if, if everybody has the right to protect themselves, I mean, I even have a gun license, you know what I'm saying? Luckily in the state of Minnesota, if you're a felon and you completed your whole complete term, uh, you can't get a gun license. And I just feel like, I. I'm not safe in this world. You know what I'm saying? So the idea is that we live in this, you know, this kind of, you know, Kumbaya, Coca-Cola commercial, that's all like a facade to give people this idea that peace has to be all of us holding hands. I, I, I'm a realist. I know that once I step out this door, there is always going to be someone, you know, who knows me or don't know me that wants to hurt me and or kill me. You know what I'm saying? We literally seen a troop, a storm troop of white people just just overtake the White House and everybody just sat back and was like, yeah, mm -hmm, until that white woman got shot and then it was real. You know what I'm saying? White people started to realize that their privileges only go so far and that, you know, they only have so, hold so much weight. But I just think that, you know, these ideas of like staying away from certain words or being PC or being politically correct or, you know what I'm saying? Respecting a person and understanding a person and taking the time to educate yourself on a culture or someone's gender identity or their sexual preference or whatever, that's important because like, that's what it all boils down to. But if you cannot like even, you know, a church or a organization that's like, oh, we can't partner with those folks because they use the word abolition. Like that's just bullshit. And like, if you're wasting your time with those type of people, then that's on you. But I don't because, you know, I know what I'm pushing for. I know that to be an abolitionist, you, that might mean losing friends, that might mean losing partners, that might mean losing funding, but you have to know that you, it, it, it's there for you, right? We know that there are abolitionists throughout the world who do have these beliefs, even now, you know, with the ideas of, uh, more people being invo involved with what's going on in prisons are important. Even, you know, even though I feel like majority of that is for show and for, you know, uh, self gratification, but for people who are really about that life and know what it is, you already know that no one's gonna like you. You know that people are always gonna be doubtful of, of you or suspicious of you because you know what type of person would want everybody to be out of prison it's the idea that you know one would think and and you know we can't be allowing people to challenge us in those ways right we Thank have you. to know that you have to stay fast and you just have to go for it and you have to keep going and going until it's done because there aren't going to be many people that have those ideas of the, or those beliefs and uh, and just try to find other ways and means, even if you have to do it yourself to make those things happen. Because 
abolition does scare people not even just the word but the ideas it scare people and it has a lot more to do with themselves than it has to do with the actual system thank you so much cc and we're we're at time we're actually a little bit over time and unfortunately our panelists won't get the opportunity to say last words but i just want to thank you all for taking the time to drop wisdom on us i want to thank the organizers and i want to encourage us all to support uh, in particular cc's work and i believe the organizers will be pasting a link to support cc and hopefully that can be distributed uh, uh soon so thank you all and uh, stick around for panel two. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to everyone on panel one. Um, thank you. It was just thank amazing you. and really powerful. Um, and um, I just want to flag the link to support CC will be, uh, and put that in the chat in just a minute. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so we're going to move on to panel two now, uh, abolishing policing across intersecting systems. Um, and just before we start, I just want to remind uh, remind you that if you're an attorney seeking a CLE credit, you have to have registered with us in advance and you have to write down the CLE codes um, as the moderator announces them. And they will also be displayed uh, during the panel. Um, so moving right along, um, <laughs> then this next panel is moderated by Deborah Archer who's a professor at NYU Law, where she's the co-faculty director of the Center on Race, Inequality in the Law. She's also a nationally recognized expert in civil rights and racial justice, and she teaches, teaches and writes in the areas of racial justice, civil rights, and community equity. She previously worked as an attorney with the ACLU and the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she litigated in the areas of voting rights, employment discrimination, and school desegregation. She's also the president of the uh, ACLU. All right, uh, take it away, Professor Archer. Uh, thank you, Claire. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to host this important discussion. As you know, today society is having a really long overdue conversation about the need to fundamentally reimagine policing and public safety. But this conversation has to be about more than a reexamination of traditional policing. We also have to examine the expanding role and power of the police. We have to challenge the many ways in which we import the racism of the criminal legal system into education, housing, immigration, technology, and work, giving the criminal legal system a much broader province of impact and influence. And we also have to examine the ways in which society gives police officers outsized power to shape and dictate our lives. And tonight we have an amazing group of speakers to help us think through some of these issues and provide insight into the numerous ways in which communities and systems are impacted by police, the criminalization of marginalized communities and incarceration. Um, and so we, as I said, we have a wonderful group of folks with us tonight. Um, first is Cyan Germu. She's an Ethiopian American attorney, writer, consultant and researcher on migration with a special focus on gender and sexuality. Cyan is the legal director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and the founder and director of the Queer Black Immigrant Project. We also have Sarah Hamid, an abolitionist and organizer working in the Pacific Northwest. She leads the policing technology campaign at the Carceral Tech Resistance Network and co-founded the Inside Outside Research Collaboration, the Prison Tech Research Group. We also have Jeanette Oriana, a 17 year old high school student from Queens, New York. She's a youth member of Girls for Gender Equity, an intergenerational grassroots organization committed to removing systemic barriers facing girls and non-binary youth of color. Jeanette is also a New York Civil Liberties Union teen activist project organizer. And this is her first panel. And then we also have Jared Trujillo, a policy attorney at the New York Civil Liberties Union, where he focuses on advocacy surrounding the inequities and scope of the criminal legal system. Thank you all for joining us. We're gonna start with a discussion amongst the panelists and then turn to questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please do enter them uh, in the Q&A box. To get us started, can each of you talk a little bit about how policing and criminalization show up in the area you work in 
or in the communities you work with. And can you talk a little bit about the tools and strategies you're using to challenge or, or address that? Maybe we can start with Sayad. Sure, um, I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me before I begin. It sounds Sound great. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Professor Archer for the introduction. Um, it's such an honor to be on this panel with folks who possess such extremely sophisticated social consciousness and who are so powerfully aware of the intersections between our respective abolitionist movements. I'm really in awe of the invaluable movement lawyering and grassroots organizing work that everyone in this panel and the last panel has been engaged in. And I'm really overjoyed to be in this space thinking critically about criminalization and carceral logic. So, um, I want to begin by contextualizing how I am personally entering this conversation. I'm a Black immigrant and a human rights lawyer who's deeply entrenched in the immigrant rights and BLM movements. In my role as the legal director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, also known as BAJI, um, which is the first and largest national Im Black immigrant rights movement in the nation, um, immigrant organization in the country and also proud abolitionist organization. We often begin our work by first acknowledging the root of migration issues, which is um, the bread and butter of our work. So we do this because um, as a whole, we reject the way questions around immigration have been framed for us in the past. So as organizers and as directly affected people, we have done the work of developing framing that really fits our unique experiences and identities. So when we look at the issue of immigration in the United States, we begin by acknowledging that the US extracts wealth from black nations like Haiti and Nigeria, for example, um, forcing us to migrate elsewhere. We also know that coups and military uh, interventions by the US also lead to mass migration. So it's important that we always create space to acknowledge the role that the US plays in creating the unrest and deprivation that forces us to flee in order to survive. Um, and if the US is where we as black immigrants land as a result of forced migration, we're then met with anti-black policing systems and racist immigration laws and policies. So then um, by our logic, the problem is not that we have a racist immigration system because we don't really have what can be called a meaningful immigration system at all. We have a criminalization and deportation regime that seeks to control and treat um, immigrants of color as the enemy. And that is our experience day in and day out in this country. White supremacy has been really cemented in immigration law dating back to 1790 um, uh, Naturalization Act, which was only open to free white people to become um, citizens of this country. So then from there, we have a wide range of laws put in place to codify racial hierarchy um, from the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act to the 1924 Quota Act, which was structured to maintain an Anglo-Saxon majority and predominance in the US. From there, we saw the formation of border patrols to sort of regulate the number of Mexican migrants um, and laborers permitted into the US, which developed this idea for the need of border security against migrants, which has since evolved into the really frightening militarized border that we have today. So with respect to the Black experience in the US, after the forced migration of enslaved Black people to this land, Black movement or migration within the US was regulated by fugitive slave laws. So as we know, enslaved Black folks in the South sought to flee the persecution that they were experiencing under the system of slavery, although we rarely refer to it in human rights terms or as persecution. Um, and they sought to um, seek 
a level of liberation, some level of liberation in the North. However, slave patrols would hunt and forcibly return Blacks seeking freedom um, back to the South. So with respect to post-slavery migration of Black people, we've witnessed intensifying racist and xenophobic immigration policies targeting and criminalizing Black immigrant communities. So what does this mean for an organization like Baji, a Black abolitionist organization, we're looking at the regulation of human movement um, from slave patrols to border patrols. Um, and we know that all of this was done to sort of cheapen and weaken the labor power of people who are given inferior immigration status and denied citizenship. So when we think about black migration, the parallels between slave patrols and ICE is very clear. Accordingly, when we speak about abolition, it's really the beginning of a larger conversation about liberation, as the last panel alluded to. We know that these laws regulating the movement of people were part of a larger project of codifying a white supremacist state. And the immigration laws in place today are still um, doing that work in a really ferocious way. We have various visa restrictions and asylum bans that are preventing people from seeking refuge after their home countries have been sort of ravaged by imperialist policies. Consequently, it seems that we have open borders for capital um, and then close borders when it comes to um, refugees and displaced people. So despite this sort of growing awareness that this, this system is flawed, a lot of which has happened within the last four years, um, we have not been able to disempower and undermine this white supremacist deportation regime in part because we have really struggled as a community to build power and meaningful coalitions to do this work. Um, in my view, uh, one of the biggest failures of the larger immigrant rights movement in the US was not creating an inclusive and truly cross-cultural movement for change. We consistently see that immigration enforcement disproportionately affects Black immigrants, yet mainstream media, policymakers, and fellow activists often frame immigration as a non-Black Latinx issue, which leads to the intentional erasure of Black and Indigenous people from conversations and debates about immigration and the path forward in this country. Additionally, despite the fact that police are the first contact most immigrants have with the deportation system, the mainstream immigrant rights movement has by and large left the need to confront policing and incarceration to black people. Um, that is until this moment that we all find ourselves in where we're now witnessing a really interesting shift in language and ideology around um, policing in this country, um, which I think um, a lot of us fail to give credit where credit is due, um, which is to generations of tireless organizing by BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities um, that have really been working to dismantle the systems that perpetuate white supremacy, um, whether that is the prison industrial complex or um, immigration and custom enforcement. So if there was more cooperation between mainstream immigrant rights movement and perhaps racial justice groups and PIC abolitionists from the beginning, we'd probably be in a much better position at this time. Um, that does not negate the fact that we still have a real opportunity right now to make those create, um, create those connections and really um, have an opportunity for change. We know that the same racist policing that incarcerates non-immigrant folks of color in America also affects those of us who are immigrants. And at Baji, we've seen how the government's increasing focus on immigrants with criminal records has sort of disproportionately impacted African and Caribbean immigrants who are more likely than immigrants from other regions to have criminal convictions or at least to be identified through interactions with local law enforcement because of rampant racial profiling. 
as a whole, there's an incredible amount of investment going into criminalizing Black communities regardless of crime rates. And when we get more police in our communities, we also unfortunately experience more deportations. So that, um, in a nutshell, is what we're up against at this moment. I'm happy to speak to some of the organized resistance and what we envision for our collective futures later in our conversation. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette, would you like to go next and talk a little bit about Girls for Gender Equity and the work that you're doing? Yes, hi. So my name is Jeanette. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a part of Girls for Gender Equity, um, specifically their Sisters in Strength program. And we have been working to get rid of police in schools because I feel like that's a major issue that affects that affects the youth because young people's minds are molded at a very young age, obviously. And when they're getting mistreated by the police, that shows in their adulthood, adulthood and how they grow up and affect other people. And students of color specifically are being targeted by the police in their schools, a place where they're supposed to be safe, a place where they're supposed to learn and grow and want to be educated. That's not what they're, that's not, they, they don't want to go to school. Police in schools is making them feel like criminals. It's making us feel like we don't belong here. It's making us feel like we shouldn't go to school because the moment, not all schools, but some schools, majority of schools that are Hispanic and black have metal detectors when you first walk in. And it makes sense to have metal detectors at an airport because you're traveling because someone may have weapons, but at a school, someone can literally just be wearing some jewelry, a watch, a belt. They have to take all of that off just to go through a metal detector to get an education because the school may fear that children have weapons, that children may hurt adults, that children may hurt other children when they just wanna get an education. That doesn't make any sense. Also, the presence of the police officers alone already tells students of color, wow, we have to have police here because they have to control us. We are animals, we are, have to be tamed. Because in predominantly white schools, they don't have all these police officers. And you would think that in a pandemic, there would be less police officers in school. When in reality, there's actually more, more police officers in schools during a pandemic in which there are less students in school. How does that make sense? Because if you had a police officer following you around everywhere you went, doing your daily routine, you would feel uncomfortable. You would feel like you're a criminal. So why would that be different for students who attend school? Also, students who do mess up, they're children. We are children. I am 17. We're children. If we accidentally hit somebody or play fighting with a friend, making jokes, cracking, I don't know, maybe we talk back to the teacher, we get punished harshly for minor infractions that some of us can't fully develop and understand why. Because our brains don't develop until we're 25 years old. So how does a child, elementary school, middle school, high school, how do they understand why you're punishing them for something as little as maybe dropping a pencil and picking it up or maybe accidentally hitting their friend after they made a funny joke against them? Or maybe there was a fight between two students and it broke out and it was big. But instead of helping those students, instead of being like, guys, let's talk this out. Let's sit, let's have a conversation between you two. Let's solve this problem. You wanna use violence of, against these students. And sometimes the minor infraction isn't even an infraction to begin with. Like that one girl from Farmington, New Mexico, wanted an extra milk, of course she was black because if she was white, this would have never happened to her. It would have never happened to her. She was thrown against the wall just because she wanted some extra milk. 
imagine that. Imagine you wanting extra milk from your school cafeteria and you not being able to get it and being thrown against a wall for wanting extra milk. Instead of punishing the girl, they could have asked her why she had that. Why did she, what did she want the extra milk for? Can she not, does she not have food at home? Can she not afford it? Can her family not afford it? And why does it have to be like, what if, what, can't she just want an extra milk? Maybe she was thirsty. Maybe she don't want water. Maybe she just wanted milk. What, what's the issue with milk over wanting some milk? And this girl who was eight years old having to be thrown and she was crying. She was telling them to stop, but they didn't listen to her. Also, police do not make schools safer at all, period. Because a lot of students, especially students of color in New York, do not like the police. They are against the police. So why would they feel safe in school with police? From already from an outside perspective, they are scared of the police. They see the police and they're like, oh my God, we have to be calm. When in reality, the police should be calm. Why should we have to act differently towards the police? The police should know how to act towards us. Also, biometric surveillance. A lot of people don't know what that is and facial recognition, it's a kind of a software of cameras that watch you. And from your face, like your, some of you guys have iPhones, you know, a face ID, face ID, it's like that. But the cameras are watching you and they can identify you from your face. And this technology has been proven to be racially biased and inaccurate. So this is another addition as to how the system in the school is already against students. And police can use the system, ICE can use the system against students who are undocumented. And school is supposed to be a safe place for all students, regardless of immigration status. But thankfully, Governor Cuomo in New York, he signed the bill to ban biometric surveillance technology. Unfortunately, other schools across the states in the US do not have that same privilege. Also, there are many students who already joke about school being a prison because we have to be there for eight or seven hours a day. It's a joke, it's funny, but with this, with police, with metal detectors, with all these cameras watching us, that's not a joke. There's a fine line between a joke and reality and it's blurred in schools because of the police, because of these cameras, because of all these things that are criminalizing students. And this fuels the school to prison pipeline. Students, they don't like school already because they have to go there by law. A lot of students don't understand the privilege that they really have by getting an education when in other countries, people fight for that right. And police do not make them want to learn. And when you don't go to school, when you don't learn, when you don't have at least a high school diploma, how are you supposed to find a job that will pay you enough money to support yourself, especially in New York? Because New York is expensive. Rent is not even $2,000. Well, I don't know about y'all, but for me, it's not even $2,000. So how is someone supposed to pay for themselves without a high school diploma and get a good paying job? They don't. So you know what they do? They seek illegal methods to obtain money. Maybe they deal drugs, maybe they start stealing, whatever else that's illegal. They do those things. And what happens to them? They eventually get caught and they go to prison. And then their whole lives is just ruined because the system is not built for people of color, especially young people of color. Because I am a lighter complexion person of color, so that's my privilege. But darker people, who have darker complexions, they don't have that privilege because their skin is seen as a weapon. Their skin is dangerous. Their skin terrifies people for some reason. It doesn't make any sense. It's skin, but it does that. So like I was talking about the scooter prison pipeline, 
they go to prison and what else are they supposed to do because their whole lives is just ruined they were a young person they went to school they didn't want to go to school they ended up in prison and then let's say when they get out what are they supposed to do no one prepared them for what you're supposed to do after you got out of prison when you're a student when you're a young person how are they supposed to and a lot of people don't want to hire people who go to prison so their whole lives, it's gone, it's ruined. Um, sorry, I have a few notes beside here, I'm reading them. Also, so, uh, so how we're seeking to remove this is spreading awareness, educating other people letting them know that police in schools is a terrible idea because not everyone is aware of how bad it affects students of color specifically. Because a lot of people, they have the idea that, oh, police are supposed to help you. Police are supposed to be there for you. They're supposed to protect and serve. They're supposed to, they're supposed to be there. When in reality, most of them are against us and they don't even know us. Signing petitions. Oh, sorry. Signing petitions, no, talking to representatives. Sorry if I'm rambling. No, but go ahead. Convincing people to agree with us is very difficult, especially when it comes to police in schools, because of so like our country is so violent that it has become normalized, and we have to have people like the police to protect us. When we could we could do the protecting ourselves. Because in reality, the police, they're the people who are harm harming us more. So, yes, that is Thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, Jared, would you like to talk about your work next? And, uh, and, and I, I really appreciate it uh, hearing uh, the first two panelists and uh, for everyone at NYU uh, for putting this on uh, and, uh, and also you for, uh, for moderating this. Um, I work uh, at NYCLU. Uh, but a lot of what I want to talk about today is my work uh, through Decrim NY. Uh, Decrim NY is a collaboration of about 50 groups, give or take, uh, that work to decriminalize, destigmatize, and decarcerate sex work in New York State. When we talk about sex work, what we mean is consensual um, adult commercial sex. Um, and when we talk about decriminalizing it, we mean all parties involved in an adult consensual uh, sex trade. So that means the seller of sex, that means the buyer of sex. And so frequently in New York in particular, but really throughout uh, the United States and in other jurisdictions as well, that also means certain third parties that work together to make things safer. So uh, for, for instance, in, in, in the US, um, LGBTQ young folks are seven to eight times more likely uh, to sell sex uh, than, than their counterparts. And that's for survival, uh, that's uh, because that's for liberation, that's because you tell someone their entire life that you know their sexuality or their gender identity or expression is something they should be ashamed of and then they can make money from it. That can be really liberating for lots of folks. Um, so there's just lots of different reasons that uh, people end up in the sex trade, but we do wanna recognize uh, uh, you know, uh, make sure that folks are not criminalized uh, for say working together, for being roommates, uh, for uh, for one person maybe interpreting or while another person is providing the service. We really just wanna recognize the different ways that people organize themselves for safety. Um, the, there's a distinction between uh, being a sex worker and being trafficked. When we're talking about decriminalizing the sex trade, when we're talking about removing police from the sex trade, we're talking specifically about people that are, are trading consensual sex. What brought, what brought me to this work, uh, two different things. Uh, one, my personal, uh, my personal background. Um, I was a sex worker when I was a teenager, after I left home. Uh, I was also a sex worker in law school when I moved to New York. Um, also what brings me to this work is really the people that I encountered uh, while doing that work. 
up. So in particular, a lot of black and brown trans folks and non-binary folks, um, a lot of black, a lot of black cis women, um, a lot of uh, trans Latino folks, uh, a lot of the people that really, while the sex trade is criminalized for everyone in this country, in most parts of this country, uh, these are the folks just like with so many other areas of the criminal legal system that really bear the brunt of the over-policing, that really bear the brunt of, you know, what does criminalization look like? What really bear the brunt of what do the collateral consequences of criminalization look like? Something that I find really interesting about uh, the fight to decriminalize sex work is I, I really think that it could show us what decrim, what, uh, what defund, uh, what removing uh, policing could look like for so many areas. Because when you think of sex workers in this country, they, they really embody so many of the intersections of where people are criminalized. So again, you know, lots of different people trade sex, but the people that are overwhelmingly criminalized for it are black and brown. Um, a lot of people buy sex, but almost entirely in New York, about 94% of the people, according to a recent ProPublica report, are black and brown that are actually arrested, that are actually you know, brought to John school, that are actually uh, brought into the penal system. And so um, when you look at the racial disparities for uh, how the criminalization of sex work uh, operates, when you look at alternatives to, to criminalization, uh, which a lot of groups are have put into practice in certain areas, uh, these are things that we're doing in certain pockets of New York, uh, I want to be respectful of time, so I don't want to like get into the weeds on everything. Uh, but if people ask me questions about it, I, I'm happy to talk about that and, and rant your ear off about it. Um, but uh, you know, it, when you look at you know like the ways uh, that uh, keep, that communities have found to keep themselves safe, it really shows just a lot of different alternatives uh, to um, to uh, policing. And finally, what I'll say about it is that you know. When I first started organizing around sex worker liberation, uh, probably around 2004, 2005, um, sex workers largely weren't even really seen as people. Uh, they are easy to make the brunt of jokes. Uh, that's because they do a profession that we say is, um, is stigmatized, that we say is less than because you do it, uh, that we, you know, there are folks that we consider to be on to be living on the margins, particularly the folks that we criminalize for this, um, and folks that already occupy, the criminalized folks that already occupy a lot of identities that we already put less value into as a society. And so it was, you know, the idea of sex work liberation was it, it, in, you know, the movement isn't new, but it's always really been hard fought that in 2008, uh, the federal government passed uh, SESTA and FOSTA, uh, the, Stop the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act and the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, which really made sex work just so much more dangerous. It, it, made, it, um, it made it very difficult for sex workers to be able to sell sex online, uh, which meant that uh, the whole profession was pushed even further into the margins. It was harder to screen clients. Um, and ultimately people had to go back to more dangerous clients. And it did all the things that sex workers told Congress that it would do as far as making the trade uh, more dangerous. And it did in fact do that, uh, despite the fact that 97% of our senators voted for it and almost every member of the house voted for it as well. And so since SESTA and FOSTA happened, there's really been this resurgence of sex work activism. Um, and this was in 2008. So since about April 2018, 18, sorry, uh, there's been just this real research and research into sex work activism. And we've had a lot of legislative wins. Uh, in New York, we recently had a huge win in repealing the uh, Lording for the Purpose of Prostitution statute. In Seattle, they were able to repeal a similar statute. And then in several other cities, they've been able to repeal similar statutes. Uh, support for defunding uh, or dismantling the NYPD vice squad um, has gotten a lot of proper, a, a lot of popular support, um, including from a couple of former cops who admit that uh, that the uh, that the unit shouldn't exist. Um, and then finally, as far as just getting one of the things, and this I think is emblematic of every defund movement, because as a society we've been conditioned to think that the only ways that we can solve our problems is by policing them. Um, we've actually been, in order to get, in order to break people of that, 
you need to show people that there are alternatives to policing. You need to show folks that there are different ways that you can invest in communities and different ways that you can invest in you know, problems, whether they be public health problems or something else that actually increase safety and, and reduce harm. And as sex workers, we were actually able to do that. So at the city level, we were able to get certain funding for, for, different, uh, for different programs that were detached from the carceral state. And they're uh, been able to do that on several upstate counties as well. So um, yeah, I will stop there to be mindful of time, but I'm certainly happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, and Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I wanted to start by expressing gratitude to Professor Archer and my fellow panelists, both for um, sharing this space and the amazing knowledge y'all have shared and built. Um, I'm entering into this conversation as a Muslim and an immigrant um, who uh, went through the war on terror during my formative years, which means that experiences of surveillance and militarization were formative for me. Um, my work at CTRN, and our work rather, is um, primarily around archiving, cataloging, um, and building community knowledge around carceral technologies um, alongside resistance strategies for those technologies, and my own work is in the domain of policing. Um, over the past 20 years, I think our concept of what we think we're talking about when we use the word technology has really changed, and it has changed according to what um, folks in the global north have has seen implicated through um, almost every single domain of their life, right? We don't even think about mainframes and computers anymore. We think about apps and smart devices and we think about interfaces. And so when people bring that position into conversations about policing technology, they think about things like facial recognition, they think about things like risk assessment technologies, um, and they think about things like predictive policing. Um, but if we think about the conditions of surveillance and um, data accumulation that makes our technological present possible, you quickly realize that Policing itself is actually imbricated into the very history of that technological present. Because for almost 200 years, policing has been an institution that's been data rich because of its particular relationship to vulnerable communities and its capacity to innovate new ways to surveil and catalog and criminalize those communities. And it's also been this vast resource conduit because it's been able to capture large amounts of public resources and devote those resources towards public-private partnerships that then get serviced for innovation. And so a lot of our work at CTRN, it's kind of breaking open this concept that policing is incidental to technology or that technology has edge cases that go bad when it enters into the domain of policing. Because what the reality is and what the history is of our technological present is that policing has been fundamentally involved in building that present and innovating everything from telegraph networks to cellular phones through mobile phones and in, in cop cars to databases and enterprise software and all of those things that we needed in order to get to the present that we're at. So this idea of trying to limit um, the technological access that police have it ignores both the history of technology and the history of policing. Um, I think that one of the ways in which um, that reframing becomes really productive is that when it starts to force people to be accountable for what their consumption um, what their consumption choices carry along with them. So in a world in which you have face print soft, uh, uh, the capacity to unlock your phone with face print is a world in which you have facial recognition technology that also catalogs the movements of your undocumented neighbors and gives that information to ICE. Um, a world in which you have the capacity to catalog and appraise the social media posts or Google queries of a white supremacist is also one in which you have the capacity to do that for Black, Indigenous, and formerly colonized organizers in the United States, the state has a higher likelihood of viewing as a threat. 
And it doesn't even go like it goes far beyond that, right? It's not just about criminalization through these technologies, it's the other effects of these technologies as well. A world in which you have artificial intelligence, for instance, that gives you the ability to have smart searches and personalized searches and all of these wonderful services that we've grown accustomed to is one in which um, we massively accelerate climate change and we recapitulate that old problem in which the consumption habits of the global north, uh, the costs of those consumption habits are, bo are foisted upon um, people in the global south. So in this case, um, the effects of climate change intensifying things like rising sea levels and affecting people in my own home country in Bangladesh. So a lot of our work at CTRN is about forcing folks to recognize that our technological present is very much a function of policing carcerality and the racially extractive capitalism and that history in this country. And, and um, the way in which we've been talking about this entire program, creating a vision for abolition that undoes the carcerality of that present also requires creating a vision for the present that undoes our technological present because you actually can't have one without the other. And I'll open up the space because I know we're over right now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I wanna follow up with a question, I think that comes a little bit from what Jared said, but also that's been raised in the Q&A box. And it's a question that we've heard, uh, I think frequently over the course of the last year in response to conversations about defunding and abolition, and it's what does abolition look like? So what do communities look like if movements and your work in particular is successful? How would we, the institutions and industries that you've described change? How would they look? And who would like to start? Jared, um, oh, go ahead. Jared, let's allow no, no. you to start. <laughs> I was say Jared because the, in the question and answer box, someone specifically is directing it to Jared, but Cyan, you started, so I would love for you to start. Okay, sure. Um, one, this is an excellent question. Um, and I think that the last panel did a really great job of distinguishing between reform and abolition um, and what that means in different spaces. So I can, I can speak to the immigration space. Um, so when I envision um, success or abolition in um, the area that I work in, that includes sort of upending the systems that are in place at this moment, right? Um, so building off of some of the themes of the last panel, we're not trying to replace the noose with the electric chair, right? We don't want to improve the techniques that are used to harm and kill our communities. Rather, we want to undermine the institutions causing those harms in the first place. So, I can lay out three um, pretty big, um, but really foundational changes that Baji and our partners envision as steps towards success um, in the realm of immigration. And so the first is fairly obvious, which is abolishing ICE and the idea that we need to detain immigrants and individuals fleeing harm in their home countries. Um, and I want to be clear that this is not in the sort of the sense of bureaucratic shuffling that enables the creation of a, another agency that does the same harm, but under a different name, but truly abolishing the system um, that allows us to remove people from their home here in the United States and sort of toss them wherever um, we need to end that. The second would be uh, defunding CBP, which is Custom and Border Patrol, um, while working towards abolishing borders altogether, which is a critical element in the struggle for liberation, um, and specifically Black liberation. Our freedom um, as human beings to move is, is key um, in my vision of what liberation is. And so CBP is a huge barrier to that. Um, and that would be the second step in um, our vision of abolition. The third 
Um, and final thing that I think we probably share um, as panelists working in a lot of different fields, um, and that is divesting ourselves from carceral thinking altogether um, and instead investing in social issues that have already been brought up by all of my fellow panelists, like housing, like healthcare, education, and jobs with dignity. That's where our resources should be going. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it to Jared now. And, and I really appreciate your answer, um, particularly uh, when you spoke about, uh, you know, like not just divesting from the institutions that cause harm, but making sure that that money goes uh, to actual community and to making sure that we're not just reinvesting um, in in other organizations that are just gonna cause the same harm, but under a different name. And ultimately for sex workers to really have liberation, we have to do the same thing in New York. Um, you know, right now the NYPD vice unit uh, has an $18.2 million uh, pot of money that they use every year. And what do they use that pot of money for every year? Well, listen to vice officers themselves. Um, they, they admit uh, that they use that money to target sex workers. Uh, they admit that they use that money to entrap people that are not even actively engaging in sex work. They admit that they use that money and the overtime uh, that they're able to charge the city to you all, uh, they admit that they use that uh, to get overtime, uh, to still uh, exploit sexual favors from sex workers, and then to just arrest them anyway. So taking that $18.2 million pot of money uh, and putting it to areas that are actually gonna uplift community. So uh, in New York City, there is uh, supposed to, there was supposed to be a $675,000 pot of money uh, for an LGBTQ uh, youth unity uh, work program, which is supposed to create jobs for uh, queer and trans runaway and homeless youth, uh, you know, to be able to actually enter the workforce. Well. That program was defunded in the middle of the night with no excuse. Fund that from that 18.2 million. Uh, the sex worker service center that the city started with about a $3 million pot of money that's grossly underfunded, that could do so much more as, provided, as far as providing people with immigration services, as far as uh, providing people uh, you know, with like housing services, as far as providing people with legal advice for what to do if their children are taken from them, um, as far as providing people that might go, because unfortunately some people that enter the sex trade consensually do end up getting wrapped up in trafficking because of the way that we criminalize sex work. Well, creating more support, supports for people to leave that if they want to do it, and also funding, uh, not state agencies, but funding so many of the community groups like Make the Road, like Community Health Action, like so many other groups that really do the work to elevate communities. There's just so much good that you could inherently do from that $18.2 million pot of money that isn't investing in probably the most horrific arm of the NYPD that just runs roughshod all over people's rights, uh, really for fun and for sport and for an overtime paycheck. Um, so that's what a lot of that defunding looks like. Uh, but to answer uh, the, the second part of the question, I guess the first part of the question, um, as far as like, what does a world, uh, you know, like what does this world look like uh, without, uh, without criminalization? Well, again, it looks like people not being afraid of vice. It looks like, you know, really empowering because sex work has been criminalized for so long, sex workers have already created complex communities and, and, and not complex communities in other ways to really deal with you know, the pressures of the job. So being able to, and like enabling sex workers to be able to screen their clients without, without the fear of those websites being shut down which is a real way that sex workers up until 2018 were able to enhance their safety. I'm um, in order to give giving sex workers more time to negotiate things like condom use by removing criminal penalties, um, giving people that were sex workers that don't wanna be sex workers, ability to, to enter different jobs. You know, one of, I'm sure everyone here knows this, but you know, criminalization doesn't end at you being thrown into a cage. That's just the beginning of it. 
the collateral consequences for any criminal offense are pretty are pretty severe. And for sex work, they are dire, whether that includes uh, making it more difficult for someone to adjust their immigration status or excess housing or, or finding another job. Just simply having that scarlet letter of a criminal conviction or even a violation for some sex work offenses could just impact so many different levels of people's lives. So, you know, removing criminalization and also defunding the carceral state in, in all of its ways, whether that's CPS, whether that's the NYPD, whether that's immigration, uh, would really elevate communities, enable people to, and enable people, sorry, uh, to be empowered to, you know, just really enjoy their lives in ways that they should be. Uh, but for the fact that we're investing and putting people in cages for no, real, no, for no real good reason. Thank you. I can, I can jump in to answer that question. Um, so I think that um, in the context of my work, abolition means undoing an entire industry and um, recognizing that that's a global industry. Um, a lot of times the conversation is about reforms and abolition. And I think that in this context, it's about prohibitions and abolition. And that's the binary that we're always working with because a lot of times the impulse is to set prohibitions on the use of technologies by particular state actors. And that's really well-intentioned. And I understand where that comes from, but it comes from a place that doesn't recognize that what we have is a global industry and the United States plays a very particular, but still one role in that industry. It's one node in that circulation. And so prohibitions that are put in some places will have an effect on where these technologies travel in other places. The founding story or narrative of CTRN is um, this moment uh, a few years ago when organizers in Southern California realized that the gang databases, the Cal gang databases that they'd been organizing to set prohibitions around had actually been replicated and implemented in parts of rural Utah because in rural Utah, they were policing um, folks who had internally migrated within the United States because of gentrification. And so that realization that these technologies has, have afterlife and the prohibitions that you set in one context will have an, implement, will have an effect in other contexts um, made us follow these different circulations and realize that what we're contending with is an entire industry that we need to make morally and politically reprehensible. Um, right now in Portland, there are in, in Oregon, there are moves to after the summer's uprising to put prohibitions on things like the use of CS gas um, without recognizing that the Portland Police Bureau actually has partnership relationships with police departments in the global south in which they train police departments in the global south to police. And so the weapons that we put prohibitions around in the United States are going to be sent to those contexts. And in many cases, they were actually designed for those contexts. Um, for instance, the cluster of grants that went into funding the 2009 cluster around predictive policing in cities like Chicago and Los Angeles' laser program, a lot of those programs have been deprecated because they weren't ever intended really to police Americans. They were actually intended for global markets. And you're seeing them now being showing up and being implemented in places like Lahore because those are police departments that are actually resource scarce and they can make that argument. And so these technologies can be marketed to them. So for us, it's about abolishing this entire um, circulatory system in which you're seeing militarization and weaponry and technologies get exchanged through these nodes and to move away from this model in which we're always reacting by putting prohibitions or containments or rather pushing these technologies outside of the United States um, without any awareness of how it's going to affect the rest of the world. Uh, and, and Jeanette, before you go, the organizers asked me to read the CLE code and it is two root, the number two, R-O-O-T. Uh, and I'm sorry, Jeanette, please go ahead. So I envision for the future of police free schools for police to completely be out of schools and maybe have like one or two security guards just, just in case. But if we really do need the police, we could call 911 and 
call the police like every other person does when they're not in school, when they're living their everyday lives. And making students feel enjoyment, enjoyment when going to schools, making them wanting to learn, making them feel like it's a safe environment for them to progress and become successful, successful and happy adults when they get older. And then perpetuating that in their families, their friends, and their loved ones overall. Because when you are in an environment that is so negative and so unhealthy, obviously you're gonna perpetuate that around you. And it's gonna snowball into something horrific for you, for your people in the life, for people in your life and for you yourself. So by getting rid of the police, it just, it's like taking a heavy energy off of your shoulders. And not only are you good physically, your mental health is a lot better. Your emotionally people are a lot better. And attendance rate, attendant, attendance, attendance rates go up, graduation rates go up, academic achievements go up, expulsions and suspensions decrease. And we will protect ourselves. We will learn how to deal with our own issues instead of relying on a system that wasn't made for us and that actually is against us. And instead of like calling the police or relying on the police to help us in situations that are schools, like nothing violently crazy will happen in a school. I mean, except for some situations that are less likely to happen, like every single day at your school all the time or schools all over the place. But I just feel like overall, take the police out of schools and make the Department of Education do that because the NYPD no longer have control over police in schools. They move that, they try to shift the money because they try to say that, oh, we are investing more money into schools when in reality, they shifted who owns the police in schools. So it's no longer the police, they, and with the NYPD, they no longer have control over police in schools. It's the Department of Education. So now we have to look towards the Department of Education to get rid of police in schools. So I wanna take a question from the Q&A. And this one um, asks, given the topic here and our focus on intersecting systems, what would the people on the panel say in response to immigrants' rights advocates who believe that border abolition and abolishing ICE is not part of the same struggle to abolish the prison industrial complex? Anyone want to, to jump in on that one? I, I can I can say something real quick. Um, I, I just I would disagree with them, um, as I, I tend to think a lot of people on the panel would as well. Um, I, I really think when you talk about abolition, it's it's really important. One, as far as base building, uh, as far as base building, you know, who sees himself as an abolitionist and who wants to be part of this wants to be part of the struggle. Uh, but then two, like just like recognizing that the way that you might be criminalized might be differently might be different than how someone else is criminalized is to really have a really big umbrella as far as who the police are and what jail is and what the prison is, industrial complex is. Um, and when you do that, I, I just, you know, ICE, they operate detention centers, they rip people away from their families. They are every bit as racist as the, uh, as the penal system, every bit as racist as a child welfare system. Uh, they just inherently, uh, they do so many of the same functions and they operate so similarly uh, to, uh, to what other law enforcement does. I would just really disagree uh, with the idea that uh, abolishing vi ICE is not part of the same fight as abolishing vice or as doing any of the, of the, of the other work we're talking about tonight. Um, so I'll, I'll just piggyback on what Jared has already shared. Um, I think my earlier comments sort of point 
to the various ways in which immigration enforcement does not exist in a vacuum. So really any time that immigrants interact with the criminal justice system, whether that interaction involves um, crossing the border without inspection, um, minor traffic violations, sex work, they could potentially end up in deportation proceedings. Um, also, because um, I am a part of a Black immigrant rights organization, I have to highlight the fact that many Black immigrants live in communities that are subject to heavy policing. And as a result, we're more likely to get racially profiled and end up in immigration detention and deported. Um, that's what I saw all around me um, when I was living in my um, old community of um, Brooklyn. And that's what I continue to see now, even in a very different community, which is Houston. Um, so as many of us know, the direct connection between immigration and criminal justice system was expanded um, in the mid 90s, specifically in 1996, with the passage of the Illegal Immigration Reform and um, Immigrant Responsibility Act, also known as ERA ERA. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go I'm not going to delve into what all era era did, but I will say that we saw federal immigration authorities sort of delegating um, enforcement um, responsibilities to state and local law enforcement agencies through formal agreements under a program um, known as 287G. So these contracts became a lot more popular after 9-11 and ramped up um, even more, if you could imagine, um, during the Trump administration. And then as of, I believe, June of 2020, 77 state and local law enforcement agencies um, had signed 287G agreements allowing selected jail officers to determine removability of individuals in their custody and sort of like initiate removal proceedings. Um, Beyond those sort of agreements, we know that police have long worked in cooperation with ICE to arrest immigrants, um, leading to their detention and deportation. Even during the recent Black Lives Matter protests in New York City, we saw ICE agents working alongside police to take protesters into custody, even though that's prohibited under the agency's guidelines. Um, and so at Baji, we're now engaged in FOIA litigation to figure out how and why the illegal cooperation continues to happen. Um, so this is just like one clear example of how state apparatuses are used against people who are non-citizens. And then now they're slowly also being turned against individuals who are citizens of this country. Um, and I think particularly for people of color, we know that we're more likely to land on the side of the community that's being over-policed. Um, and so I think that the connections um, that exist there are, are fairly obvious if you wanna do the work of digging a little bit, but I think especially for communities of color, there's great reason for alarm um, and great reason to be cautious that some of the hyper um, uh, criminalization that we see happening with immigrant communities is very easily transferred into um, US communities as well. Uh, Sarah Jeanette. Yeah, um, I just to also echo what Jared and, and what everyone said so far in terms of how there's a lot of overlap between these two institutions. And I think that in the domain I work in, it's also very similar in the sense of like walk like a duck, talk like a duck, right? The technologies that get transferred and exchanged between these two modes of violence and um, is like, it makes it so that it becomes very difficult to conceptualize them as not being the same mode of violence, right? Whether you're talking about electronic monitoring or you're talking about what's happening in detention centers, risk assessment, things like that, right? Um, but also the way in which technology gets wielded as a reform technique in policing 
exactly what we saw would happen during the Obama administration and the 21st century policing initiative is also the response that you're seeing in the context of immigration, right? Like the Democrat, establishment Democrats response to the Trump wall is, was the smart wall. What is the smart wall if it's not drone surveillance and facial recognition and machine recognition and object recognition, right? So those kinds of ways in which these technologies get exchanged between those domains, I think Jeanette's been doing this beautiful job of articulating how the school starts to resemble a prison through these technologies. And so similarly, the border starts to resemble a prison through these technologies and it becomes impossible to then conceptualize these two domains as distinct. Jeanette? So I completely agree with what everyone has said so far. From the outside perspective, right? Let's say you're not from the US. When you first come to America, I feel like it would be very difficult for them to distinguish the difference between the police and ICE because essentially they're kind of the same thing, but except for ICE being specifically for immigrants and the police being for everyone else. So when you look at it like that, it's like the same people with like different names. It's the same systems that use the same methods, like um, Sarah said, like using biometric surveillance, using facial recognition. They use the same technology. They use the same methods. Um, I forgot who said it, but they train each other with the same ways. So how are they not the same? It's like saying, I don't know, one system does this and this and this, and the other system does the exact same thing, but this one's Joe and this one's Bob. I don't really like, I feel like maybe not exactly the same, but they're so similar that you really can't tell the difference. So, yeah. All right. Unfortunately, we are um, out of time and don't have time for more questions. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, all of our panelists for sharing your time and your wisdom. And a special thank you to Jeanette for joining us for your first panel and doing it so brilliantly. Thank you all. And I'll turn it back over to our symposium organizers. Yeah, so thank you guys. Um, thanks big time to our panelists for sharing such powerful examples of both the ways policing impacts your communities as well as some of the strategies that you and others are using to remove policing from those spaces. This concludes day one of Defund to Abolish. We hope that you will join us tomorrow to hear from practitioners creating abolitionist community care and safety systems in their own communities, as well as organizers waging campaigns to defund the police. The link for tomorrow's panels is the same as the link they used tonight. And everyone also should have received an email with a take action resource, which was crowdsourced from our panelists with dozens of ways to learn more, support, and get involved in the movement to defund and abolish the police. So if you're feeling inspired, which you no doubt are, I encourage you to take a look at that. So um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can email us at defund to abolish 2021 colloquium at G or sorry, defund to abolish colloquium 2021 at gmail.com. Thanks and good night.